Hi, everyone. Um, many thanks for joining us today in this webinar called uh, Path Planning in Robotic Additive Manufacturing. Um, so this is the first webinar of a series of three. So the second webinar will be on the um, 20th of um, October on process simulation. And the third one will be on the 24th of November on real-time monitoring. So uh, this webinar is organized as part of the Softdrink project uh, funding by the EIT Manufacturing. Um, my name is uh, Anne Kerwe and I'm working as product manager in Aerospace Valley, a French cluster specialized in aeronautics, drones and embedded system. Uh, I will be today the moderator for this uh, webinar. Um, so at, at first I will present you shortly um, how this webinar will work. So um, we, we were thinking at the start to have our videos on, but with the numbers of participants, we, we won't have our videos on, so sorry about that. Um, after all the attendees' microphones are muted, so you can only ask questions uh, by writing the question in the tab, uh, questions. Uh, if we do not have the time to answer all the questions during this webinar, you will get the answer uh, to your question per, per email. Um, the recording of this webinar and the presentation will be available after 48 hours, and you will receive the links directly per mail. Uh, if after the webinars you have some questions, uh, you can contact uh, directly the speakers. Uh, their emails uh, are available in the presentations. Um, so I will now uh, introduce you the three speakers for today. So the first speaker uh, is Francisca ascher uh, She is a research scientist at the Technical University of Braunschweig. Uh, she is currently working as a PhD student in the area of incremental manufacturing involving additive and subtractive manufacturing technologies. Uh, the second speaker uh, is Emil Johansson. Uh, he is a research scientist in additive manufacturing at the Research Institute of Sweden. He has an extensive experience in materials and process development and is currently working on robot-based additive manufacturing of large-scale thermoplastics and short fiber composites. Uh, the last speaker today is Vasan Churchill. He is a senior applied scientist and machine learning methodologist at the research Institute of Sweden, specialized in additive manufacturing and industry 4.0. He is currently developing software and digital tools for robotic arm-based hybrid manufacturing. So uh, now I will now leave the floor to our first speakers, Francisca. Thank you. Thanks, Anne, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Francisca Aschersleben, and I welcome you to this webinar as well. So in the following, we have a short look at the agenda of this webinar. Uh, first of all, I start with the basics of robotics and additive manufacturing. Uh, then we present the scope of our project SoftDream to you. And um, then we will come to the main part uh, where we present uh, specific methods for path planning for robotic additive manufacturing which uh, includes the circle pack packing, uh, some theory about graphs, the non-planar slicing, and finally the skeletonization. So robotics in additive manufacturing became a great topic over the last years, but not only additive, but also subtractive. Uh, for both of them, we are able to use uh, the flexibility and the adaptability of of robotics and we know that there is a broad knowledge available at the companies uh, but they are usually used for example for handling or for welding tasks but we just need to go combine a printing head with a robot and then can realize processes like FDM, SLA or SLM and then we are able to build three-dimensional parts made from plastics, metal, or also composites. And um, this can be also done in accordance with the required accuracy, mechanical stresses, or thermal loads. So we, we are 
besides uh, rap rapid prototyping, we are building real parts. Also, subtractive processes like milling can be achieved. Uh, they can be used as post-processing, uh, for example, to even improve the sur uh, surface quality of the printed part. Um, so here you can see the main challenges in additive manufacturing. Uh, they are displayed in this map with the main components of quality and process control uh, on the top. And uh, below, we can see that there are subgroups subgroup, from uh, pre-processing to post-processing, multi-material printing, efficiency, uh, the design for additive manufacturing, automation, flexibility, and software. And in pink, I highlighted the advantages of robotic systems in contrast to traditional 3D printing systems. So there's, for example, the planar or non-planar slicing. Uh, a Cartesian printer is not able to print in a multi-actual manner. So um, the multi-dimensionality of robots is the greatest advantage here. So we can print from different directions. We will later have a focus on this. Another aspect is the fact that uh, it is possible to print as well larger parts, but also smaller parts. So the printing volume uh, can, can be really great. Uh, but also really small, so we are quite flexible uh, regarding our workspace. And with the flexibility of a robotic system, it is also possible to print on already existing parts with a predefined structure or predefined um, curved surface. So hybrid structures can be realized um, easily. And since many uh, production companies have already robotic systems available. It is uh, quite efficient to upgrade them to be uh, to have a printing robot system. Uh, here you can see an overview of the printing system. Um, usually it consists mainly out of an industrial robot, a printing bed and a printing head, the material supply, the higher order control, and of course the robot controller. And you can see that the possible printing area is quite big and only limited by the size of the printing bed and um, the size what the industrial robot can reach. So the system is really flexible. And for example, you can uh, add an online supervision system if you need it, and it can be applied in different production areas. And with with this kind of setup, it is possible to realize high, de high deposition rates due to the scalability of the system. Uh, here we have uh, we have a great example um, for a printing process. Um, it is uh, based on an extrusion system, and um, you should uh, take a look on the great overhang and the size of the part, which is really significant for the printing process. And as you can see, the printing head is tilted by almost 45 degrees, and um, the printing direction is almost horizontal. So uh, we are allowing uh, flexible geometries with a high printing speed. So as a next step, uh, Amy will give you a short overview of our project SoftDream. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, yes, so my name is Emil Johansson. I work at Research Institutes of Sweden and uh, I am the leader of the SoftDream project. Uh, the SoftDream project is a research and innovation project funded by the European Union through EIT Manufacturing. And the aim is to develop a generic software solution uh, for robot-based additive manufacturing, where we supply uh, toolpath generation, process parameter optimization, simulation capabilities, and real-time monitoring interfaces. Um, so if uh, we go to the next slide, the motivation for this project here is, um, of course, based on a number of industrial challenges that we have seen in the last few years, and which are 
typically addressed using additive manufacturing. So you might have uh, product personalization, mass customization, or um, uh, on-demand manufacturing, for example, for spare parts. Uh, but uh, as you all know, product systems can be very rigid, difficult to change. And uh, typically, especially for high parts, you have high costs and long lead times. And the good thing here is that industrial robots can solve many of the limitations that we see with 3D printing today. It uh, will not be like a one solution fits all, but uh, it can solve, for example, uh, scalability, flexibility, as we have seen uh, in uh, Francisca's presentation here, uh, cost, uh, robots are relatively cheap compared to the size, uh, but also process integration that we can use robots in existing production systems very easily. But what we saw is that there is a uh, lack of software, uh, making it easy to use the full flexibility of robots for 3D printing. There are software, but we want to make it as easy as possible. We can go to the next slide. So our solution here is uh, to develop a cross-platform API. That's the core of the project. Uh, in order to help uh, users of Robotic AM succeed as well as possible. And as I said, this involves everything from design, simulation, and process planning, to uh, toolpath generation, which fit the flexibility of the robot, to real-time monitoring, which we will have a dedicated webinar about later in, in November. And of course, uh, since we are not building a fully-fledged software here, we're building an API. What we want to provide is something which is generic, and can be customized based on the um, user needs. We can go to the next. So SoftDream then is uh, sort of the, the way to uh, unlock this functionality for existing software. So the idea is not to replace, uh, say, an offline programming software, and the idea is not really to replace a 3D modeler. The idea is to provide the level of functionality that will let you use robots for 3D printing as easy as possible. So the way we do this is that we have different interfaces to connect to our API, for example, via a, a traditional REST API or through a C++ SDK, Python bindings. We also have a web and desktop user interface, which you will see a demonstration soon. Um, and we can also connect directly to the industrial robot. And through SoftDream, then, you get access to all of this uh, functionality, some of which is based on the concepts that we will be discussing today as well. Yes. Um, and just to show you what the, uh, the um, desktop and web clients are looking like today, um, this is uh, one example. Here we have a Kuka robot but we can use any kind of robot, any kind of system. And this here in this video, you see a demonstration of a non-planner slicing where we use, um, it's a propeller blade, which is printed on a curved surface. And then it has been sliced specifically to let a robot print it using non-planner slicing. And we will, discuss how to do that a bit later on as well. Great, so this uh, project then, uh, if we go back to Francisca's excellent uh, chart, it addresses some of the uh, key points that is the benefit of using robotics. So for example, uh, we have the process control, uh, but what we will be talking about today is mostly related to the uh, path planning, of course, which is the um, um, flexibility, printing on parts, uh, improving the efficiency, for example, and, uh, and uh, specifically the pre-processing then and the slicing. And we can go. So uh, this project is, of course, uh, a number of partners. And I said it's funded by EIT Manufacturing. So we are three research partners in the project, RISE, 
Estia from France, um, Theo Braunschweig from Germany. And we have uh, Volkswagen, Aerospace Valley and Spectrum Technologies as industrial partners. Um, and the idea is to have a really high innovation in this project at a high TRL. And um, in the end, we'd, we will have a spin-off company in early 2021. That is the idea. So that will be the outcome of the project. And we can then go uh, on to Francisca to start talking about the really interesting aspects of path planning for robotic AM. Yeah, thanks a lot, Emil, um, for the um, for talking about our our project. And now let's move on to uh, the path planning for robotic additive manufacturing. And as as we have seen before, it is a great challenge uh, due to the high grade of flexibility of robots. So to start, uh, I present you the main slicing strategies that can be divided in four categories. Um, at the basic slicing, uh, we always have the same layer height and you can, it can lead to the staircase effect that we don't want to have because we want to have accurate parts. Uh, in contrast to, to this, the adaptive slicing has different layer heights and therefore can avoid the staircase effect. Um, at the third one, we have the non-planar slicing with curved layers, and it can have a really smooth surface finish, but is on the other hand very complex to realize. And as a last strategy, the modular slicing divides the printing part into different components and finds the best printing strategies for each of them. So different printing directions can reside in great shapes of the part. And within these layers, there can be different infill patterns, like everyone knows from the traditional 3D printing, from, uh, for example, from the zigzag to continuous path or to uh, path based on the medial axis transformation. Uh, each of them has a specific advantage and also disadvantages and um, the inf infill density can be adapted based on the estimated stresses uh, that act on the part. Uh, it also plays an important role to the duration of the printing. Uh, the more material and the more traveling moves, the longer is the printing time that we always want to reduce. So the strategies are um, independent of the slicing methods and uh, can be selected depending on the, on the case. Uh, further, together with our industrial partners, we have analyzed the influencing factors on the path planning. And we also defined key aspects that are the most important ones for robot-based additive manufacturing. And the first one is uh, fast printing, which is really important for industrial application because if the duration is too long, it doesn't fit in the locally existing production system. Um, the slicing is also important because we uh, want to increase the quality of the components. And as a last aspect, the, an intelligent path planning is necessary to um, receive lightweight structures, for example, which uh, also could lead to a cost reduction. And as you can see highlighted in this map, um, circle packing, the traveling salesman problem and skeletonization are spe special methods to achieve these requirements. And in the following, we will explain how these methods can affect the path planning for robotic additive manufacturing. So first of all, I will start with the circle packing for variable density infill. Um, usually with the so-called circle packing, people try to find rules to arrange circuits in a way so that they take as little space as possible. You know that, for example, from soap bubbles, which are arranging themselves closely to each other. So the nature knows how to do it, but um, 
there are still challenges for us as humans to also apply this to artificial problems. So in this case, we want to use it for creating this variable density infill. Uh, first of all, you can see this method in detail. Um, it is based on the inversive distance, and this is an indicator for the grade of overlapping between two circuits. Uh, the calculation is based on the radius and the distance between the circuits. And um, as you can see, if the inversive distance is equal to one, the circuits are tangent, which is the aim of this method, because we want to have them as closely to each other as possible. So first, with the inversive distance, we can calculate the pushing or pulling force between the neighboring circles, which are here connected by the um, light blue edges. And then we calculate the resulting inversive distance and resulting force between these circuits. And um, the resulting inversive distance is then used to adapt the radius and the force is used to adapt the position. And then art, after iteratively applying this method, we receive, we receive a pattern without overlapping circuits. So they are finally arranged closely to each other. So now we are adapting this general method for, to uh, the generation of an infill pattern. Uh, it is the aim to refine an already existing infill pattern at regions where it is useful due to, for example, uh, external loads. So first we choose the basic pattern, for example, a honeycomb pattern with a specific density. And after, in the second step, we choose um, an area which is highlighted by the arrows that we want to refine so that the part is more stress resistant, for example, but still has a lightweight structure. And based on the circuit packing method, the refinement can be obtained and um, it is close to the optimal state uh, so that we obtain a homogeneous structure. And this can be, um, this is comparable to the refinement for FE analysis. So uh, what, what does it look like exactly? Um, the basic process is visualized here just for, for one layer, for a planar layer. And uh, first, the size of the circuits define the infill density. And after the refinement, we choose the grade of refinement based on a second size of the new circuits. Uh, we are connecting these circuits with the existing ones. This is essential because it defines the neighborhood between both patterns. And after running the algorithm, the pattern looks really smooth, as you can see in the right picture. Um, so there's also a small video to visualize how it really works. Um, the size of the circuits and the position are adapted at the same time. And uh, after a few iterations, they are um, adapted the position and the radius so that uh, they are really close together. So um, after we received um, the pattern, we can um, extract a printing pattern from this. For example, here it's in red, an hexagonal pattern or triangular pattern. And finally, we limit the pattern to the surrounding of the printing part, which can, uh, is visualized in red on the last picture. Um, in gray, you can see the high density area and there's a smooth transition transition to the basic structure. And now I want to hand over to Vazan, who gives you an introduction into the application of graph theories. Yeah. Thank you, Francisca. I'm Vazan Churchill, a senior scientist at Research Institutes of uh, Sweden. Today I'll give a brief talk about graph theory and its applications in additive manufacturing. What exactly is a graph theory. If you have a collection of objects and some relationship between them, how do you represent it? A graph theory is a excellent graph is an excellent way to represent it. Each object, it's known as a vertex, 
on the relationship between any two vertices, it's called as an edge. So graph is a very powerful tool to explain this relationship. Say for example, it could be a directed graph where you have a directional relationship between two vertices, uh, like in a toolpath, the movement, you describe the movement from A to B or B to C. Or it could be a undirected graph like in the mesh. And this is a very powerful way. It's not only the relationship, there are many other theorems which clearly help to understand how we can organize the things in the network. They have many applications in areas like tool optimization. Maybe you can click. Yeah, tool path optimization, collision avoidance, and process simulation and decision making in control systems. So they have a lot of applications, and I will be talking more about tool path optimization in the next slide. Yeah, so what do we need to do the tool path optimization? If we take a desktop 3D printer, you may not gain much by using the tool path optimization, but in a large scale additive area manufacturing, large scale additive manufacturing, like using the robot, if you use tool path optimization, you can have significant time savings, which is a very important aspect. And then I want to minimize the start and stop. If a robo goes through a lot of start and stop cycles, then you will have a blobs, which is very difficult to control and it spoils the aesthetic nature of the printing part. Next is the distortion. If I optimize the tool path, it gives me the time, probably like now, what, how long it takes to finish the layer height, which controls the cooling rate. And if I control the cooling rate, then I can control the distortion. And the cooling also controls how my layer, current layer, is going to adhere to the next layer. So I can improve the layer addition. And once you have a very good layer addition, you can have a very good strength. So there's a lot of motivation to do the tool path optimization. So how graph theory can help? So as I explained earlier, you have a lot of points, a collection of points, which is the uh, tool has to move and the relationship between the points and how important is the relationship between these two points that's described by the edge weights. And this weight can be either distance, say for example, if I want to move from the node F to C, it can either go F, A, B, C or F, D, C. So how do I decide? That's based on the distance. It takes the path which has the least distance or it could be a robo inertia. For example, if a robo wants to move from F to C, the path F, A, B, C might be the shortest path. But if I give robo inertia as a weightage, it's not optimal path because the robo has to take a lot of directional changes, which increases the year. So in that case, FDC is an optimal path. So based on this weightage, the optimization can vary. So this is one of the advantages of assigning the weights uh, to the graph and solving them using it. Another is the thermal history. If I have a simulation and if I can assign the thermal history for all the nodes, the current and the past and you know the next iteration, then I can optimize it for a distortion or for layer addition. And then for structural stiffness, say for example, if I take a path around the perimeter, the perimeters contribute more to the stiffness compared to the infill inside. So I can optimize, so I can give the weights based on that. So there are a lot of applications and optimizations I can do using the sage weights. And one of the ways to do that is the Chinese Postman problem. So if we go to the next slide. So what I, before going to Chinese Postman problem, let's uh, and let me start with the classical problem. In the city of Konigsberg, we have two wildlands and the city, which are connected by seven bridges. And you have to cross each bridge exactly once and you have to visit all these land masses. This was a classic problem and it was posed to Euler. And while solving this problem, he developed a new field called graph theory. So there are a lot of items, there are a lot of variations of this problem, like traveling salesman problem, arc routing problem, arc routing problem, and node, node routing problems. So Chinese postman problem, if you go to if you click on, it's called as a arc routing problem, where you have to consider a rural po consider a postman who works in a post office and he has to go and visit each and every house in the locality and he wants to minimize his work. So he has to visit every edge and return to the post office. 
and the optimal solution is if he goes to through all the states just only once sometimes it may not be optimal in that case what are the smallest number of edges or streets he has to traverse twice or thrice to uh, achieve his goal so this is the aim of the chinese postman problem and using this we were applied to the tool path say for example he travels the black path shows that the tool traverses once and the red is the when it traverses the multiple multiple times which is the edges to duplicate in other words in 3d printing parlance it's the the black is called the printing moves and the red is called the retraction moves so this is one way of optimization here we gave the edge as the edge distance the distance between the hexagon sides as an input but it could be any other as i mentioned the thermal history or the robo inertia yes so yeah so a very powerful tool the chinese postman problem or a traveling salesman problem they are very powerful tools and they rely on graph theory to optimize so we have used extensively used uh, graph theory in optimizing various aspects for example in simulation so yeah and uh, i'll hand over to francisca to talk about non planar slicing yeah thank you very much for then um the next method i want to talk about is the non planar slicing and as we have already seen in the introduction it is really important for us to take advantage from the flexibility of the robot and this is one of the most famous and most important um so in general there are three different methods available of non planar slicing for the first one we have curved layers with an adaptive height um in the second one we have a combination of flat layers and on top there's um there are curved layers to um have a smooth surface but as you can already see there will be uh, holes inside which lead um can lead to a structural failure and the last one is a three dimensional tool path and um it's going through all the through the whole object and um here it is important that uh, for the first two ones the direction of the printing nozzle is vertical whereas at the, in the in the last one the uh, direction of the nozzle is normal to the printing path and this is what we want to use in our project to um get an advantage from the robot's flexibility so to realize the last stage uh, we have been working on an algorithm that looks like uh, follows so um yeah we need two components which is first of all the part um that we want to print which can be an stl file and um the second one is a surface a curved surface that we need to slice the part and um with successive uh, intersections we are offsetting the uh, surface step by step through the printing part and um yeah it works like uh, first of all we are offsetting the mesh and second step we are uh, calculating the intersection between the two me meshes and then as a last step we can generate a path on the 3d uh, three dimensional surface and um, one of the main challenge is the computation time because it's um, quite expensive to uh, calculate these uh, intersections and here we have um, an example of how it looks like um, in the video on the left there's a normal planar slicing of uh, this object and um, you can see for example there are many traveling parts uh, below of the part whereas you can see on the right side which is the non planar slicing uh that there are no traveling parts and that you have a smooth surface finish after after printing and um 
that's it for the non-planar slicing. And in the last section, Emil will talk about uh, the shape abstraction and skeletonization. Thank you, Francisca. Yeah, so in this uh, sort of tour where we scratch the surface on different uh, technologies and methodologies here, uh, the final is uh, sort of shape abstraction and specifically skeletonization. So if we zoom out a little bit uh, from the actual tool path and consider uh, the non-planar slicing, for example, or the infill, uh, what we really need to do is to analyze an entire geometry and decide how we're going to print it. And one way to do that is to use uh, shape abstraction to find uh, different regions of the part which needs to be maybe segmented or printed in specific ways. Uh, which I will explain in the following slide. So, shape abstraction is basically any kind of methodology where you take a, a mesh, for example, and you reduce it to something which is a little easy, more easy to uh, understand and perhaps perform analysis on. Um, so, one way to do this is uh, popular. It's called the skeleton, um, the topological skeleton, which is basically a thin representation of any kind of shape, where this uh, representation is equidistant to the boundaries of the shape. So it becomes a skeleton of the shape. Uh, there are different versions of this, depending on if you're in 2D uh, or 3D, for example. So in 2D, um, you have on the left, the medial axis. Uh, and on the right, you have the straight skeleton, which is a variation of the medial axis, where all the segments of this skeleton are straight. Um, and then if you move into the 3D region, you can analyze polygon meshes instead, and you can let them shrink together. So this is a popular um, geometry in, in uh, geometric computing. It's the Stanford bunny. If we let that shrink down and we can represent that with the uh, 3D skeleton instead, you can see that um, we get this kind of representation where you have the ears uh, as two, um, two parts of the skeleton and then the main body as the, the, uh, the sort of main part of the skeleton. Uh, and then this way of representing shapes has quite interesting applications, which I will explain in the next slide here. Um, so uh, skeletons are used a lot in architectural modeling, for example, to calculate how to build roofs. Uh, so a building, if you look at it from above, is a polygon or maybe a polygon with holes. And then you can analyze the skeleton to sort of determine how your roof is going to look like. Uh, that's one popular way um, to use skeletons. You can use it to calculate offsets in Polygon or to process biomedical images, for example, to analyze the shape of blood vessels. And uh, then when it comes to 3D printing, skeletons have uh, been commonly used, for example, to calculate curve offsets, uh, as we see on the left here. Um, you can just traverse the skeleton and determine the offset of the curve in 2D. And then you can have one shell in your part, two shells or multiple shells, or even fill the entire part uh, using this um, kind of methodology to extract the toolpaths. But if you move uh, then into more of a conceptual level, what is really interesting here is that you can use skeletons to analyze a part and determine how it's supposed to be printed. So for example, uh, in both 2D and 3D, we can perform feature extraction using the skeleton, which uh, is, is a quite an interesting field, which has received a lot of uh, new papers in the last uh, couple of years. So if we again take this example of the Sanford bunny, here you can see that we can, using the skeleton, determine that the Stanford bunny is composed of a main body in green and two um, ears, red and yellow, which then could be segmented into three different parts. We can deal with these parts in a different way. 
we could slice the main body in one way and the rest of the bunny in a different way, for example. The third really interesting field where shape abstraction comes in here in robotics is path planning. And skeleton is, is often used to path plan, uh, for example, AGVs or any kind of unmanned automated vehicle. But we can use it to plan the path of a robot, uh, like a six axis robot as well. If we analyze the um, sort of cross section of where the robot has to move and we can see and determine the best possible path for it to move so that it doesn't hit for example a part that is being printed uh, so there are some really interesting areas here uh, especially if we combine it with the non-planar slicing uh, and we combine it with the gra graph theory and uh, i just want to show you um, quickly how to do a computation of the straight skeleton uh, because i am incredibly fascinated by this uh, but it's also quite interesting so um, Calculating the straight skeleton is done in three steps if you want to simplify it. And the, the process is very simple. Uh, you take your object and you let it shrink down and you trace the way it shrinks until you are end up with a 2D curve, basically, or a 3D curve. Um, and this is done in three steps. So first, you need to determine what happens with all the edges and all the vertices when the shape is shrinking. And this is maybe the difficult part because edges can collapse, they can split, they can form new edges. Uh, so it becomes a, que a, a question of identifying all of these events. Once you have done that and determined when they occur, then you simulate the shrinking uh, or simulate the wavefront propagation with the wavefront being the edges of the part as they are moving inwards and trace where uh, the, the vertices are moving as this uh, shrinking process occurs. And in this way you can construct the skeleton and then if you traverse the skeleton you can uh, use it, for example, to construct curve offsets. Now, this interesting part here is that the skeleton is a tree-like graph structure. So, to analyze it, we can use graph theory. So, it all comes back to, to the way we analyze geometries. And this is maybe one of the key takeaways here, that uh, the analytical part of uh, the 3D printing uh, is, is really crucial, especially for robotics. So uh, in the next slide, I would like to just make a conclusion here. Um, it has been a very, very tightly packed 45 minutes now. Um, robotic additive manufacturing is, of course, a vast field, and we're just now seeing uh, the fantastic opportunities that we can have. Uh, for example, in manufacturing concrete bridges um, or thermo plastic fiber composites with wood fibers or metals for, for that matter. And uh, we have just given a short introduction to some of the main concepts and some of the uh, enabling methodologies that we have sort of determined uh, are critical here. But of course, there are other interesting aspects. And uh, for the final 15 minutes here, we will have time for some, uh, some questions about some of these concepts about the project, about robotic additive manufacturing. And with that, I will give back the word to Anne again. Yes, so many thanks, Emil, Francisca, and Vassan for this uh, really interesting uh, presentation. So exactly, we, we now have some time for some questions, so you can write them in the tabs questions. Uh, we have one already, so I think uh, it's for you, uh, Emil. Um, is the SoftDream API suitable for the WAM, uh, so the wire arc additive manufacturing process uh, as well? Uh, yes, exactly. So uh, the idea about this API is that it will be very generic. So at the base level, it should be so generic that we can apply it to different robots. Uh, different robot OEMs, different uh, equipment that you put at the end of the robot. Um, 
and in the Softdream project, we have one use case, aerospace use case, where we are going to use cold metal uh, transfer technology to print uh, metals using a robot. And this will be done in, in France by our partner Estia. So uh, the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, of course, wire arc additive manufacturing is very, very complicated if you compare to, uh, say, thermoplastic extrusion. But we believe that uh, the generic approach is, is uh, applicable here as well. Yep, many thanks, Emil. So uh, that's the, the only question that we have uh, on, the, on the chat. Um, so if you have other questions coming afterwards, you can send us the question directly per mail. Uh, there is uh, the, speak the email of the speakers uh, on the first uh, uh, slide of the presentations. Um, so um, just as, as a reminder, so this webinar is the first of a series of three. So um, you will uh, receive the, the link to the recording and to the presentation uh, in 48 hours. And uh, you will also have the the dates for uh, the next webinars in this uh, in this project soft dream so there is a second webinar on process simulation plan on tuesday the 20th of october and the third webinar on real-time monitoring plan on tuesday the 24th of november so that's the same time frame as today so um the only thing remaining for me is to uh, say uh, really thank you to everyone uh, of you uh, for your participation in this webinar, and uh, we hope to see you again in the next ones. So many thanks to everyone. Bye.